Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for a very special edition of HR Mentorship Learning Series. Tonight, we'll be looking at a very unique and sensitive topic, HR and religion in the workplace. Our facilitator for tonight is a brother, a friend, a colleague, Tochuku Me. He's a learning and development professional and will be speaking to us tonight on human resources and religion in the workplace. I would like to read a little about him so that we can get better acquainted with him and give him all the rapt attention required to optimize our learning session tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Totuku Emeka Ume is a highly qualified and accomplished professional with a strong academic and career background in business administration and human resources. He holds a bachelor's degree in business administration, specialization, specializing in management from the University of Maldugui and furthered his education by earning a master's degree in business administration from the American University of Nigeria, Yola Adamawa State. Totuku is committed to professional development and it's evident through his affiliation with prestigious organizations. For example, he is an associate member of the Nigerian Institute of Training and Development and he is an associate member of the Charal Institute of Personnel Management of Nigeria. He has also earned a professional certificate, okay? He has earned a professional certificate in human resource along with his practitioner's license from the Charal Institute of Personnel Management of Nigeria. In his professional journey so far, Tochuku began as an administrative assistant at Forward in Action for Education, Poverty and Malnutrition in Bauchi State, where he gained valuable experience and exposure. He then transited to a role at the International Committee of the Red Cross, RICRC, where he started as a water and habitat program administrative assistant over time, he climbed the ranks to become a supply chain officer and eventually found his true calling in the human resource field, where today is a trainer. Since 2022, May, he has been serving as the learning and development trainer, Nigerian delegation within the HR team at ICRC. Totuku's passion for education is evident in his dedication to unlocking the potential for greatness with individuals. With his diverse academic background, professional certifications, and extensive experience in human resources and training, Totuku is a highly competent, focused L&D specialist. And tonight, this evening, we are privileged to have on this, I'm tempted to say pulpit, Instead of lecture, Tochuku Ume, over to you, my brother. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I am very excited to be here. Uh, I do not take this privilege for granted. Thank you, uh, my mentor and my friend, uh, Oli Emi. And thank you, friends, everyone joining from everywhere around the world. I am excited to be sharing these few moments with you, and I am looking forward to a very rich engagement where everyone will live here with something. Uh, to begin tonight on the subject matter that we are looking at, which is um, HR uh, and religion in the workplace. Someone might ask, why do we want to know about this? Why is this topic important? First and foremost, this is a very crucial topic and it is totally in line with modern HR practices. It's not just a topic, it is actually the core of HR practice in the modern era. Then we want to also look at um, the importance of um, appreciating our rich religious diversity in Nigeria. You must understand with me that Nigeria is one country that has 
a whole lot of people from different walks and backgrounds, different ethnic religions, uh, ethnic uh, ethnicity, religion, affiliations, and what have you. So tonight, we want to take this opportunity to appreciate, you know, our religious diversity in the country and also to provide valuable insights and strategies for you, my friends, and HR, the HR practitioners in your various fields to navigate this religious diversity effectively in the workplace, leading to more uh, productivity for your organizations. And lastly, we hope to look at some of the uncomfortable religious practices in the workplace and what we can do as HR practitioners to moderate some of these practices. So these are some of the reasons why it is important that you devote the next one hour thereabout of your time listening and engaging with everyone on this call tonight so that we all can learn something valuable. Having mentioned that, I want to go next to look at some statistics that uh, are relevant to us today. Um, according to Statisense, it says that about 89% of adults that attend religious service weekly you know, uh, in Nigeria, we have about 89% of our adults who attend religious activities on a weekly basis. This is according to the statistics they took. Then, um, still on these statistics, we have uh, prayer, and, and then those that um, countries that rank highest in prayer and countries that um, rank also highest in terrorism index. So you would see on these parts of countries that rank high in prayer, we have uh, Afghanistan first, we have Nigeria, our beloved country, ranking as second. But then on the most terrorized countries in the world, we have Afghanistan as first, and also Nigeria as the number eight on that list, as well as some other African countries where prayers and religious activities happen or are in their highest uh, 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 numbers. Why is this so? Why do we have this variation where we have a lot of religious activities, yet we are having a lot of terrorism activities happening in these countries. This shows us that religion is a very serious issue in these areas, in these countries, which Nigeria is one. If you don't handle religion with the right uh, um, way you are supposed to handle religion, it may escalate activities like this and this is not where we want to be we rather want an environment you don't want to see some of these um activities happening or events happening in your organization we want an environment that is calm that is uh, um cool that is um cooperative encouraging for everyone in the organization to contribute their best so if this must happen we need to pay close attention to religion and all its shades in, way, in the ways that it appears in our organization to tackle them more effectively. This is one of the most important reasons why you need to engage with us in the conversation tonight. Having mentioned that, what do you define or how would you define the concept of religion in Nigeria or in the world globally? We have, according to Britannica Dictionary, that it refers to human beings' relation to that which they regard as holy, sacred, absolute, spiritual, divine, or worthy of special reverence. Okay? This is the definition, what people hold sacred, what people believe is divine, what people believe that it's uh, worthy of reverence. Okay? So this is one area or how to define religion. For me, in a very sh nutshell, I want to look at it as simply human beings' ways of relating to higher spiritual powers, okay? Many people believe that the world is controlled by some spiritual powers somewhere, and they want to relate with these powers for maybe worship, for guidance, or whatever. People want to relate with these higher powers. Having mentioned that, Nigeria... In, in our country, Nigeria, religion is not just about beliefs. It's our way of life. It is the way that we live. It permeates every area of human life in Nigeria. Nigeria, like we have seen, is one of the most religious countries in the world. Most religious countries in the world. So we cannot 
uh, play uh, Keith Glove, okay, to the concept of religion, especially its appearances in our workplaces. We cannot assume that the concept of religion can just be ignored. We cannot uh, totally wave it off and pretend as though it doesn't exist. Yes, Nigeria is a secular country, then nevertheless, people in Nigeria are very religious. So we must ensure that we manage our religious diversity in especially the workplace very well so that the humans in the workplace feel a sense of belonging and the organization has a conducive environment that will promote you know, cooperative and collaborative effort of everyone leading to more productivity in the organization. Having mentioned that, Let's look at one quote from John Bella, Bellamelli, who said that religion has been an aspect of culture for as long as it existed, and there are countless variations of its practices. Today, you will agree with me that in Nigeria, we have different practices or different ways that people choose to relate with a higher spiritual being when it comes to religion, okay? Different ways. We know some of the very common ones. We know some that also are not so very common, but all these are existing in our country, Nigeria. And common to all of this variation of the way people try to relate to a higher spiritual being is an appeal to a meaning beyond the empty varieties and lowly realities of existence. So this goes to show us that for people, religion is not just yet another activity. It is a way of life. It is something that they hold very sacred. It is something that everyone in Nigeria values very much, not just in Nigeria, all over the world, but Nigeria particularly because we, have the, one, we are one of the highest religious countries in the world. So this is a very, very serious issue. And as HR practitioners, we need to stand up and look at religion in the workplace and how it shows itself and then look at what we can do to manage religion in the workplace. Now, let us look at some demographics in Nigeria according to the International Free, uh, Religious Freedom, that's a publication by the US Department of State. They said that as of 2022, that is last year, that we have about 50% of the population in Nigeria being Muslims, then another 48% as Christians, whereas we have people that practice other religious activities that comprise about 2% of the entire you know, population in Nigeria. Now, these other, uh, other, others uh, comprise of um, the traditional worshippers. We have uh, uh, people who do not even believe in the existence of any creature anywhere that is maybe superior to human. Okay, so there are people who do not believe in religion. There are people who practice some other kinds of religion apart from Christianity and, and Islam. And these are also people that live in Nigeria. Okay, so we cannot ignore, even if it is 0.1%, they are relevant because 0.1% of over 2 million people, 200 million people is quite a number. So we must ensure that we take into cognizance the entire population of the country, especially the way it is represented in our organizations, in our decisions and actions and the things that we do in our organizations. Looking further at some of the statistics, according to the US Department of State, that we have um, about uh, majority uh, Muslims in the Northwest and the Northeast. They are majority Muslims. But then when it comes to at the North Central, we have a mixture of both, uh, you know, Muslims and Christians in almost equal proportion, right? But then in the Southwest, South, South, and Southeast, we have majority Christians there. This does not mean that the other religions are not being practiced in all of these areas, but then talking about the majority. So if this is the way that the, the the people, you know, population are being dispersed in our country. You need to pay attention to where is your organization operating? What do we do and how do we ensure that we pay attention to some of these, you know, um, activities happening in those areas, being careful about the cultural values, the religious values in these areas, respecting them and working within these conferences to uh, propagate or to, to push your business operations forward. Now, 
let's look at some legal framework in our country. Religion, as it were, uh, uh, our constitution in uh, section 38, you know, gives the people freedom of thoughts, conscience, and religion, including the right to change one's belief while also practicing individual, protecting individuals from being compelled to participate in religious activities not related to their own beliefs. Okay, so this uh, means that the supreme law of the land, which is the constitution in Nigeria, has offered protection from religious discrimination and given people freedom to practice and exercise their faith, their belief, their religion, and, and even propagate their religion in the best way possible that does not, you know, is not uh, contrary to the peace and progress of the nation. Okay, so this uh, right is, you know, protected by law. And as HR practitioners, we need to also pay attention because this is a legal framework issue. This is something that has to do with the legal framework of the country. We must ensure that our organizations, our practices, our policies, you know, have, take into co cognizance this section 38 of the constitution. Not only is this uh, legal framework in Nigeria backing this uh, freedom of religious practices, we also have other international best practices that support such, that the, such as the United Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the 1981 Declaration of the General Assembly, as well as the Human Rights, Com uh, Human Rights Committee General Comments 22. Okay, these are all the uh, framework that protects people's right to practice a religion of their choice and also prohibits discrimination on the basis of religious beliefs. Having established that this is, in fact, a matter of legality when it comes to practicing religion in the workplace, let us dive a little bit further to some of the common issues that we find in the workplace. Some of the common issues that we find in the workplace. As HR practitioners, we mostly will find ourselves in situations where there are misunderstanding and bias. Yes, this is actually factual. When uh, uh, in an organization where people come from different walks of life, where people hold different beliefs and different um, religious affiliations, you will realize that people look at things from their own lens the way they understand things, the way they, they know life is supposed to be, the, the way they've been you know, trained from home. Okay, so this is the way they see life. And there is a very high likelihood that they will misunderstand someone who does not align with their own kind of uh, uh, maybe perceptions, belief system, and what have you. There is a very high likelihood that people will misunderstand themselves. And there is also very likely a high likelihood that there will be bias in the way people make decisions, in the way people uh, do certain, take certain actions, and what have you. Okay, so these are very common to happen in an organization, and it is not out of place. So we expect to see these kind of behaviors in most workplaces as you know, we, we continue, right? So employees may hold different uh, misconceptions about the other belief. We are lucky that in Nigeria, for example, the NYSC scheme uh, is structured in a way to foster even greater uh, collaboration and understanding of different cultural uh, varieties and, and, and variations in the country. Religion also is part of it, where people are posted to different places at different times to allow them to socialize and also understand you know, the people of that area, their culture, their belief system, their religion, and what have you. So this is common. Okay, so it is not out of place to see people in your organization expressing misunderstanding in uh, uh, maybe another person's faith, in the way another person practices their own version of religion. You know, this is actually not out of place. Then uh, also, it is not out of place to experience conflicts and tension in the workplace that is rooted in religion. Okay, it is normal that people coming from different walks of life may experience or express different belief systems. And this belief system may sometimes escalate into conflicts or tensions amongst them, right? In a way that, for example, somebody wants to go and pray and uh, the line manager who perhaps does not understand maybe that 
uh, the Muslim needs to pray certain times of the day, you know, and that may happen perhaps sometimes during work hours, take some few minutes to go and observe, you know, certain prayer time. The line manager, if he doesn't or is not aware of this situation, may misunderstand that person as being unproductive. And this may cause serious tension between the line manager and the, the, the staff who is involved in that situation. So it is very common that this kind of situations may arise. So the focus is what can we do as an HR person where these kind of situations you know, show up uh, in our places of work. Then um, another thing that we may most likely encounter in our uh, uh, areas of work, in the places where we work, is unfair treatment. Okay, sometimes no matter how good intentioned you are, people may see it differently because they are looking at life from different perspectives. Okay, whether you tried to do it well or not, people might read it from different perspectives and they may feel unfairly treated. Okay, so this is normal that employees may perceive certain treatment as being unfair based on their religious beliefs. If, for example, the, the, because there is a deadline to meet and then the MD uh, mandates everyone to come to work on a Sunday. So colleagues who have to go to church on a Sunday will look at it as, oh, maybe because he's not a very good Christian. He doesn't value the Christian faith. That is why he's putting it at this time. Maybe it's because he's a Muslim. Maybe because he's not a Christian. That is the reason why he's putting it. So people will interpret it differently, even though that was not what was on your mind. So these are common things that happen, which is why we as HR practitioners need to pay closer attention to observe the ways that some of these things happen in our organization and see what we can do to nip them to the board. Having mentioned that, we will look again at some common practices. Now, uh, one of those common practices uh, are seen in our policies. What kind of policies do we put in place as HR practitioners? What kind of policies you realize that somehow the policies you put in place uh, has a way of moderating, has a way of guiding or, or controlling how these um, activities or religious activities are being carried out in the workplace. For example, if we have a workplace where everybody is from the same faith, you will realize that most of the time they will have certain policies or certain uh, clauses in their policies that promotes their faith. However, in our world of today, we realize that the world has become very global. Okay, globalization has made the world, you know, the business place even more complex. And people from different walks of life are coming into different, you know, uh, work environments and they need, they need to be accommodated, they need to be supported and all of that. So if your policies are such that is twist, uh, uh, aligned to one religious faith or promoting a particular religious faith and all of that, you will realize that somehow, you are beginning to, you know, um, exclude some people, and this might be a very serious issue. I I I went to fill my gas someday, and um, the 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 receipt that was given to me, and when I looked through the receipt at the last line, where normally every other business would write uh, something like um, "Thank you for your patronage." call back soon, you know, those kind of write-up. Then I was surprised to see what these people wrote on their particular uh, um, receipts. They wrote, uh, Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready? And I'm like, okay, <laughs> what are they trying to tell us, right? So I don't know who the owners of this organization is, but somehow they are using their, uh, uh, maybe this is a, a matter of policy for them to include their religious uh, what, uh, cliche on their, uh, on their official receipts. So if I am not, for example, uh, someone who relates to their religion, I probably would not go back there the next day because somehow uh, I came to buy something from you and then you are pushing your religion forcefully at me. Now that makes me reason in that organization, people who work there, imagine that they are not sharing the same faith with the management of that company. 
I don't know how the kind of policies that they will have in place and all of that. So it's, it shows forth in the kind of policies that we have. It also shows forth uh, in a place where, for example, everybody shares similar kind of belief, right? Then suddenly you, you begin to see certain kind of policies that has to do with um, maybe uh, it's permeates into the dress code, it permeates into um, certain observance of religious activities. And sometimes it may equally be counterproductive because you will find in those kind of places where they will tell you something like, um, okay, it's uh, because it's Salah or because it's Christmas, we shut down the entire office for the next two weeks so that everybody can go and celebrate. Well, it's good for the employees if all of them align in the same way, but is it really productive? So some of the common practices show forth in the kind of policies that we put forth as an organization. And HR practitioners are the champions when it comes to these policies. So we need to pay closer attention to some of these policies. Second is unconscious bias. It shows up in the way that we behave, in the things that we do, in the decisions that we make as HR practitioners. We may not know this. It may not be too obvious, but somehow there is this likelihood or this possibility to align to people of like manner, people who share your belief, people who share your kind of, um, li uh, what do you call it, um, uh, likeliness. Okay, there is this unconscious bias you have when you're making certain decisions, especially when it comes to recruitment. You see someone because maybe from the name or the look or whatever, you begin to assume that, oh yeah, this person, uh, instead of hiring the person of the other faith, I would rather hire somebody of my faith. I see it as propagating my own faith in the workplace. We see these things happen sometimes, some knowingly, some unknowingly. Other times you see uh, people take certain decisions because they are not aware of maybe their own bias. So as HR practitioner, you need to be aware of your own bias. Ensure to check through carefully, especially when it comes to policies or, or, or decisions that have the coloration of religion. So that you are very careful that the decisions you make, the policies you advocate, does not in one way or the other uh, uh, put certain people at a disadvantage, right? So you need to pay close attention to some of your really, of your unconscious bias. Then um, another area where we see this kind of things showing up is mixing religion in official matters. This is something that happens almost at every time. We see it in our, in our workplaces, whether you are conscious or not, it is happening. Okay. So I, I don't know how it happens in your organization. I don't know what occurs in your own um, um, organization, but it happens a lot. Some of the ways where we see this happen is when uh, I, I remember when I, I, I was um, uh, working in, in Yola and we went for an official engagement uh, with some government agencies. And then when we're about to have a conversation with uh, these officers, and then the next thing is, oh, we have to pray. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, let's pray. <laughs> so we uh, well, we have to allow them to observe their prayers and what have you. So it has become a way of life for people to pray in almost everything they do. So somehow you see these things coming into our official businesses. You see this kind of behaviors, you know, showing up in one way or the other. You see people making certain decisions that are strictly based on their religion. But then they believe that this is the right thing to do because they know that, of course, their religion is good uh, and they believe that their religion means well for all mankind. So they begin to make certain decisions with religious colorations, but then impose it on everybody and it becomes a matter of policy in the organization, right? So we see this happen in different ways. Now, in... Um, in their book, uh, or their article rather, that um, Inkechinere Ona and uh, Christopher Ugu published, uh, which is uh, titled as Prayer as a Panacea for, Panacea for Human Problems, focusing on the Nigerian Christian experience. They suggested that our leaders should adjust to starting off office activities with prayers 
as this will help take their minds away from looting of public treasury and other fraudulent acts. Okay, so this is their uh, their position. Okay, they feel that uh, prayers before the beginning of any official engagement will curtail, you know, fraudulent acts and looting, especially by our public treasury. Okay, so I would just want to hear from you at least three people to tell me if you agree or not and why. If you agree with this assertion that they have made, if you don't agree, why? If you agree, why? So uh, I, I think at this point, I just want to have three opinions. Uh, Oliemi, please, you, you permit me. Let me hear from three people at least what their opinion is about this assertion. Okay, so uh, maybe let's see. So if anyone wants to speak, just raise your hands and we'll, we'll enable you to speak. If you like to speak at this point, please raise your hands. We'll quickly enable you to speak. And if you prefer to type, it's all well and good. Yeah, let me be looking at the chat box. Do you agree? If you don't so agree, I, why? If you agree, why? I see a hand already and we'll quickly take her. So I'm making you co-host. Orikilewa, you have the permission. You can unmute, please. So someone also dropped a message. Let me read it from Pearl. She says, as religious as we are in Nigeria, we perpetuate evil anyway. So praying before meetings won't curtail anything. Thank you very much. That's a very insightful one. Um, one more person, at least. What Oyema. do you think? Oyema says, I do not agree. A lot of atrocities have been carried out in the name of religion. A lot of atrocities. Mm. Thank you, Oyema. Your, your, your opinion is well noted. Okay. Yes. Um, someone would like to speak, Afolabi. Kindly unmute, Afolabi. So that you can share your. Oh, you need to unmute again, Afolabi. Sorry. Afolabi, please unmute again, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, please. Go ahead. Okay. Yes. Good. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to. I want to say that uh, praying at the beginning of office hours, any leader or, or HR person that pray first before starting official work, have a kind of uh, element of uh, uh, fear of God in him or her. And I want to believe that such a person uh, will, will, will be very careful in whatever he or she does in the office, rather than uh, majority that may think that it is not necessary, and uh, though they don't, the fear of God will not be there. Anybody that pray at the beginning shows that there's a fear, a fear of God in it. Uh, actually, they said there are so many issues, uh, vices in the country, that's why prayers. But I want to state uh, clearly that uh, those that actually believe in prayer before they start all these hours are more uh, discreet in their whatever they do. Because they know that God is always watching what they do. So that's my submission. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much, Dr. Olabi. We'll take Oreke Lewa now and then Imole Ayo. Oreke Lewa, you can unmute. Go ahead, man. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, Good evening. My submission is this. Okay. I've happened to be in situations in organizations where this is, I'm starting from the banking industry now. When I started, there was no prayers, but when the new MD came in and we had some financial issues and all that, you know, and, you know, I feel if as a branch or as an organization, if they all agree to it. For me, this is where I'm coming from, from the banking. We had the Christians, we have the Muslims. For other religion, I don't know, but at least it was clearly, I know I have Muslims, I have Christians. So we all agreed that we want to pray in the morning. It was an agreement. Like if somebody is seated, you see somebody say, after prayer, I don't, they will start now. You know, and everybody is moving towards it. It was an agreed something. So I feel 
it was working for us, so to say. It worked for us, really. Then the second organization I was, I started, it's a, quote and unquote, a one-man business, but it was a, a Muslim person that owns it. So there was no prayers, there was nothing. But, you know, after his demise, and maybe like a year after, we thought, we felt that we needed the prayers. And both the Christians and the Muslims, they agreed to it. Now, that is another one. Then my new organization, we don't do it. Not like because nobody has mentioned it, nobody has started it, and we just rolled with it, and everybody's doing their thing. So I feel if the people, if the people agree to it, then they are, it's fine. I don't think there's a cast and stone on it, but it must not um, cut into your time. Maybe your work resumption time is eight o'clock, and you say, okay, prayers is for seven forty-five. We pray fifteen minutes. Fine. Then eight o'clock, everybody go back to their desk. If it's agreed with everybody, fine. And if you go to an organization and you meet it, then you join, you, you, these are the things you ask, even during your onboarding or recruitment process. These are the things you ask. So that when you join them and you see them, they pray in the morning, don't start feeling like, oh, why are they praying? Why are they not? You, these are the things you should have asked about. So if it doesn't align with you, it doesn't align with your value as a person, then you know you, this is, organization does not fit you. So this, that, that, that's for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. There are also some okay. comments in the chat box, yes. but let's quickly take everyone whose hands are up. Imole Ayo will we'll take you. After that, we'll take Yetunde. Yeah, maybe Yetunde will be the last person so we can proceed. Yes. Yes. That, that's why sometimes we push it to the end because it can continue <laughs> and it's even very helpful. Imole Ayo, okay. please. Okay. Good evening, sir. Please confirm if you can hear me. Loud and clear. Okay, so thank you very much. So I, in my own opinion, um, I feel this is not, um, this submission is wrong. I feel it is not necessary because I'll just quickly mention that I have worked in various organizations and there is a particular organization where we do uh, morning devotion, so-called morning devotion before we start work every day. And trust me, the war, it was there, the worst things happened from not remitting employees' tax, not um, remitting pensions, and so on and so forth, even deducting people's salary unjustly. So I feel faith should be your personal thing. Yes, like Orekelewa said, I agree. If two, three people come together and agree that, okay, let us be doing this every morning, it's okay. But I don't feel it should be a cultural thing within an organization because I feel it doesn't work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take the last voice contribution and then our first data will go through the ones in the chat. Yetunde, please. Okay, all right. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, sorry, I'm audible. Loud and clear. Okay, all right. Thank you. Um, okay, though everyone has really said what I actually intend saying, but I want to, uh, I'm not talking Mr. Faladio, but I just want to say that. Uh, eight hours that pray in the morning. I'm sorry. Some of them are the most evil. evil. I, I want just, I'm a nature, so I don't want to let you out. Some of them are the ones that even cause me issue in, in offices. In short, I don't want to call it evil in another way. I've worked in an organization that I, I don't want to mention church, but they are fired. I think from the head to the down of the executive, they are fired. And let me tell you that is is I don't want to say the most toxic and uh, worst place to ever work. That a lot of Sexual activities are even out. So let's not even put that aside. So it's not about you coming to the morning and saying you want to pray and all that. No, let it be a personal thing. Get to your table and do the prayer and let it be the thing that you're God. It's, more, it's just, just also more like where you're fasting and you're casting to people that you're fasting and all that. Sorry, you've already collected your reward already. So do your prayer on your own tables and you know, if you want to join you, it's a different thing. But making it a mandatory thing and saying that you know, leaders who are just to start in offices with. Sorry, I'm sure that some of them say when they are even in the uh, like pastors and co in their in their um, different religion and they still get in offices and still portray something so different. So don't don't let us just put the religion in, in the work. Let work be the work and religion be on its own. So thank you. Thank you so much. Over to your facilitator. Please don't forget Ted. the comment in the chat box. <laughs> thank you. Yes, yes. I'm looking through the comment box, though I couldn't scroll to back. Um, but I'm starting with the comment from Onyema Egere. Uh, I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce your name very well. So he says, um, 
I do not agree. A lot of atrocities have been carried out in the name of religion, right? Uh, Comfort Garba says, I don't agree because it's not a religious gathering. Prayers are for religious gatherings only. Okay, thank you. Uh, Oema also added to say, each person should pray at home before leaving for the office. Praying in the office doesn't mean they won't loot the treasury. Deciding not to steal is a heart and character posture. Thank you very much, Oyema. Um, Ogumbi says, uh, prayer is good in everything we do. Like here in the north, we pray before we walk and we, uh, and before we walk and we pray in both religion. Thank you very much. Uh, Adedo Isola says, yes, it is good to pray, but that it cops corruption is yet to be proved. Thank you. Uh, Victor says, uh, my opinion, praying without enforcing the right policy or SOP won't stop theft. Prayers will help, but the principles should be enforced to ensure compliance, manage, uh, manage a team of 112 employees, and trust me, goals are being met seamlessly without morning prayers. Thank you very much for that submission. Uh, Adedoy says, uh, people pray with their lips, but do not align this with their acts and action. Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for your comments and contributions. So we have people who believe prayers is good to have it as an organization. We have those that believe it is not necessarily important to have it as an organization. I don't, uh, for me, I do not want to take any side yet, okay? Whichever one you agree, but then let me also leave this thought with you to, to think about it. Um, imagine that uh, because sometimes when we talk about prayers, I've come to see in most organizations or events where opening prayers and closing prayers are being uh, uh, allowed to happen. Mostly they do either the Christian prayer at the beginning and Muslim prayer at the end or the Muslim prayer at the beginning and Christian prayer at the end. This is mostly the practice amongst organizations or people that do or, uh, this uh, prayer activity. Now I ask question. In the organization, even though they are the majority in the country, we still have people that are not necessarily uh, aligned to those faiths. What about them? What kind of prayer do you want them to pray? Now imagine that I am a traditional worshiper and I believe in the gods, okay? Whichever of the gods, uh, be it Shango, be it uh, uh, Amadioha, you know, whatever one. And um, I, I want to also observe my own prayer before work hours, would you be comfortable? Would you be there seated for me to observe my prayer and, and, and call on my ancestors and, and the gods, you know, to begin the business day? I don't know how you will feel, but I leave you to think about that. We'll talk about it a little bit much later. Um, to proceed, let's look at some statistics. Now, um, according to Pew Research, uh, in 2018, they, found, they conducted a research to find out people who pray daily, okay? So amongst those that say they pray daily, that they met and, or, and interviewed, 96% of them are Afghanistan. Afghanistan people, 96% of Afghanistan people pray daily. So that means there's about 4% of people who do not pray daily. Perhaps they pray at other times. Our beloved Nigeria sits honorably on the number second, uh, number two uh, position, about 95% of Nigerians pray every day, okay? Every day, about 95% of Nigerians observe prayers. But then on the other side, countries like China, UK, Switzerland, Australia, and, and uh, Sesia, Germany, and the rest of them, you can see the number of people who pray daily. I, your, your guess is as good as mine. They are not as religious as we are, okay? They are not as religious. They, Of course, we should expect their hearts. Going by the submission of uh, the authors I had cited earlier, okay? So if this is anything to go by, it means that these countries where prayers are not observed on daily basis should, to a large extent, have the highest level of corruption. Okay, they should have the highest level of corruption, all things being equal. However, looking again at the Corruption Perception Index publication of 2022, you will see that uh, when you com compare countries that pray more and 
countries that uh, practice corruption more. Among the, uh, uh, where do you call it? Nigeria, Afghanistan, Algeria, all these countries where we have the highest rate of prayers, they are also highly ranked and seated honorably on the corruption perception index table. Okay, most of them fall within the top half of the corrupt countries. Why is that so? Why are those prayers that we observe in the mornings, why are they not yielding fruits? Why are they not copying these corruption practices? Why are they not reducing our corruption perception index? Why is it going higher? Are we really praying? What does the prayer do for us in terms of uh, corruption in the workplace, in the country? Because uh, who we are is exemplified by uh, what we do in our offices, in our homes, in our society, and what have you. So uh, if you consider those countries that pray less, you realize that their corruption perception is even lower than countries where we pray more. Something is missing. It shows us that I'm not trying to say in any way that prayer is not uh, um, valuable or it doesn't work, but it shows that there is something else that we are not doing right. It shows that there is something we are ignoring at the expense or there is something we are doing or uh, not doing at the expense of prayers. While prayers is good, it is also important to look at all the shades of all the things we need to do. And this is where you come in as an HR practitioner. Now, observing prayers, both opening and closing prayers during meetings and events, it is good. It's, uh, it, it should be respected. People should be allowed to practice their, their religious beliefs and, and, and what have you. But then the problem is when you begin to impose it on some people. We have seen some organizations that have certain you know, practices where prayers have become mandatory. In fact, some of them go as far as observing fasting period. They mandate that, okay, a certain period and certain period, certain people must observe prayers and fasting. We see this even in some homes, it happens where the father or the mother, whoever in charge of making that decision imposes prayer and fasting on the family. Then you find certain people hi hiding behind to go to the uh, kitchen to, to you know, steal the meat from the pot, you know, hide somewhere to eat something because they don't agree with it, but they don't want to be seen as the, the, the opposition party. So you say, oh, yes, we agree. We agree, everybody agrees, but then they do not practice it in reality. We see people call for opening prayers and closing prayers, and they observe the prayers. And in fact, I have been to meetings where we started with opening prayers. And at the end of, the, before the end of the meeting, people were throwing blows. And we fight, and after fighting, and then we end it with prayers. And everybody is happy. We go home, <laughs> okay? So these practices happen. But then, does it really solve the problem? If we had these kind of things, it is good to pray. I'm not saying it's not good to pray. But the problem is when it becomes a problem or becomes uh, uh, mandatory for everyone, then you begin to have people that are, not uncomf that, that are not comfortable with this situation. But then, because you have forced them to observe this, and they need the job, they want to stay in the job, at least for as long as necessary. So they will honorably respect it, come stand there, but while you are praying, they are not there with you. Their minds does not agree with you. They, 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 they feel uncomfortable. They feel marginalized, especially because most of the time we only observe either the Christian prayers or the Muslim prayers. We do not observe the prayers from, from our colleagues who you know, uh, observe traditional belief systems. And to a large extent, we have these people, because they are minority, they, they hide their identity. They hide their religious beliefs because when they say it, they'll be seen as bad people, you know, all this kind of stereotyping that already, you know, people with uh, a certain re religious beliefs, you know, assign to some categories of persons. So this becomes a problem for them because they cannot express themselves. They are not comfortable with these practices. They also want to be heard. They also want to pray in the way that they relate to their own superior being but then they are not allowed to do this because they are the minority. And this is a problem for you as an HR practitioner because you are not creating an equal playing field for everyone. And if you want to observe everybody's prayers, I wonder if uh, uh, maybe the MD who is a Muslim 
or maybe the HR who is a Christian will be comfortable to have the, the other kinds of prayers or other kinds of consultations happening, you know, in the mornings before before any uh, uh, official engagement. I, I don't know how that is going to play out, but I'm there. I definitely know that you will not receive it well. So if we're not going to receive it well, why are we imposing it on others? Right? So why is it good to observe prayers? I, I, I mean, for many people want to observe it because they desire some spiritual guidance and some sort of unity among em employees. Of course, we cannot hide the fact that it brings people together. It, it, it gives people this mindset of, okay, I have prayed today and I know that the decisions we are making as a board, as an organization, we are going to make the right decisions because we believe that a superior being that sees the end, you know, before it gets, we get to the ending will support us. Okay, so this is good. This is one of the good reasons why people want to observe prayers uh, in official events. And then there is this also, this belief that people who observe prayers you know, before events and after, tend to have more of the fear of God in them. So most likely, their behaviors, their attitude will be moderated by this fear that is in their heart. Okay, so this is one of the belief. Then uh, some other people believe that it's also good to involve God, seek his blessing as an organization. You want the blessing of God. You can only do the, the best you can do, but then you don't know uh, without God's blessings, you're not going to go too far. So people want to involve God so that he will bless the works of their hands and their businesses will go well and what have you. This is excellent. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why people want to observe prayers before events. And then for some other people, they believe that observing prayers and, and uh, before and at the close of events gives them the courage, you know, to face challenges for the day. So they believe that now I have prayed, I have the backings of the spiritual being, and I can now be able to engage, you know, with all the challenges of today without fear. And I know that the spiritual being is backing me. I'm not going to make a mistake. These are all honorable reasons why people want to observe prayers. We do not want to discourage that. It's good. However, it has some gray areas. One of those gray areas is exclusion, like I've mentioned earlier. We have situations where people who do not practice that faith because most of the time I've come to realize that the uh, faith in which they pray or express their prayers are mostly uh, the faith of the majority. And then there is that aspect of the minority that are mostly ignored. And most of the time, they don't have a voice. So the majority seems to overwhelm the minority and they feel excluded. An organization that must compete and remain competitive in this modern era do not need to leave anyone behind. Everybody in the organization is important and should be made to feel so. So this is one of the reasons why it is not advisable to promote certain religious beliefs ignoring others. Then that comes also with a feeling of discomfort. Okay, so you are there and they're observing some sort of prayers that you do not agree with. And then you are forced to maybe close your eyes or, or maybe observe a compulsory fast because maybe it's a, it's, a, it's a Ramadan season and the MP now says everybody here must observe the Ramadan. And then you, you, you do not agree with that. But uh, even though you are a Muslim, maybe you have a very valid reason why you don't want to observe you know, the fast. And then the MD has imposed it. And because you want your job, you have to try and fast or at least pretend to be fasting. Okay, so these are all issues. It makes you uncomfortable. You are always hiding. You are not, you are worried. You, you, you want to do certain things that nobody will notice that you're doing. So this level of discomfort takes a lot of, you know, energy and it's add, it's add additional stress on this particular staff member. And that will make that person's productivity, innovativeness, you know, and contribution to the organization to reduce because he's more worried about maintaining his job, making the boss happy, and also being himself. Okay, so because you're not allowing this person to be himself, he's largely not comfortable. Then there may be legal implications, right? So. These people, you are infringing on their rights. 
of freedom, you are infringing on their rights that is constitutionally protected, that allows them freedom of religion. Because now you are imposing your religion on them. And to a large extent, whether you like it or not, you will somehow align more with the people that come to identify with you and pray with you in the way that you have instituted in your organization. What does that do? It causes religious discrimination. And this is an issue of legality. You are discriminating against people consciously or unconsciously because they do not align with your religious beliefs. They wouldn't want to come and pray with you, for example, and then you see them as this is the devil in this organization. It is him or her is the reason why we are not progressing. They are refusing to come and join us. That means what we are doing is not good for them. If they refuse to join you, you, you classify them, you know, you begin to see some sort of um, a divide, whether you like it or not, some sort of divide begins to come up knowingly or unknowingly. You begin to find those that, you know, align in that religious belief, begin to align to one side, you know, become more friendly amongst themselves, try to influence the decision more to favor them as against those that do not agree with their religious beliefs. The organization begins to tear apart gradually, but steadily, but, uh, you know, uh, constantly the organization begins to tear apart. And this is a very serious issue. You do not want an organization where people feel excluded, where people are not comfortable to express themselves, where people are discriminated against on the basis of their religious beliefs, okay? So this is one of the reasons why it is not appreciable to impose or practice some of these religious beliefs in the place of work. Now, what are the alternatives? I know that we want to connect to the uh, spiritual being somewhere in the universe, okay, to guide our affairs and all of that. It's, it's a normal longing for humans. It is not wrong, okay? It is totally okay for you to practice your religion. In fact, like we mentioned, Section 38 allows people to propagate their religion, right? But then that should not be at the expense of others because everybody has the right to practice whatever they believe in. And you shouldn't impose yours on top of another person's, you know, head to say that you must follow my way, you know, either subtly through policies like this in the workplace or directly, you know, by imposing it because you have the authority or the power to do so. So instead of doing that, you may consider uh, uh, giving a moment of reflection. Let everyone in silence observe a moment of reflection. Connect to whatever that, 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 that matters to them, something they hold supreme. If they want to pray, they can have that moment to pray. If they just want to reflect on whatever they want to achieve for the day, it's up to them. Okay, so let people be able to practice what they relate with. Okay, so a moment of reflection or a few moments of silence would be most ideal in this kind of situation if your organization is such that it has the culture of observing these prayer moments, right? It's fine to observe these moments. Allow people to pray in silence and quiet without you know, disturbing another person or, or maybe voicing their opinion or their prayers to another person that will make him or her uncomfortable, right? So this would be much better. Alternatively, you can advocate, for example, for the national prayers. Our national prayer in Nigeria remains the second stanza of our national anthem. You can advocate for the national prayers, right? So this is one of the ways we can, something that we can pray, it's, it's more of a, a, a prayer that connects to a, a supreme being, yes, but then without certain kind of religious coloration where everyone can easily relate. And I'm sure every one of us knows our, our, our second stanza of the national item, which is, O oh God of creation, direct our noble cause, guide our leaders' right, help our youth the truth to know, in love and honesty to grow, and living just and true. Great lofty heights attain to build a nation where peace and justice shall reign. I think this is enough if you must observe prayers. It's all inclusive. You realize that this prayer does not exclude anyone. It doesn't make anyone to feel uncomfortable. Uh, it, it does not uh, um, put anybody off the cliff. Okay, so it is more inclusive if you must pray, 
right? If you must pray, then look at something that is more neutral that can include everyone irrespective of their religious affiliations. Having mentioned that, we are also aware that there are some persons who may not necessarily agree or subscribe to any God at all. This is totally okay, right? So it is left for you to evaluate your organization, your workforce, and know what works, okay? If you have people like that, then it's okay to completely scrap it and let people observe their prayer. Maybe you go back to a moment of reflection. People can reflect, and, you know, whatever it is that they relate to. For, for, for some people, it is, for example, in some organizations, especially in the Western world, we see them practicing things like the yoga, where people have this moment to relax, connect with their inner being, and, and um, maybe think through whatever that matters to them connect, relax, and, and find strength from within, okay, whatever that means to them, okay, so you create that environment to allow people to connect to their inner being or to whatever uh, uh, creature they hold supreme anywhere, so uh, uh, choose whatever that works best for your organization. Then, having mentioned this, what is the HR's role in promoting religious inclusivity in the workplace, okay, of course, we know that the HR sets the tone for inclusivity through its policies, practices, and behavior. So not just what you, you preach as an HR, not just the policies that you advocate, not just the practices that you advocate for in the organization. People are watching you as the HR. You are first and foremost the one that will lead these policies and um, um, practices in the workplace. So people are watching you. So what do you do as an HR to promote an working environment that allows everyone, you know, to, to relate and, and, and feel comfortable to work in the organization? One of those things you can do is to promote an inclusive mindset. Now, like I mentioned at the beginning, people come from all walks of life. People have different you know, uh, perceptions and mindsets about the other faith, the other religion, the other uh, um, practices. People have the way they see them, maybe from their own shallow understanding, or maybe perhaps from the way that um, uh, certain uh, religious leaders may have indoctrinated some persons, and they come out with all sincerity to contribute to the workplace, but then they are battling internally with their religious beliefs and the people they meet in the workplace. So it is your role as an HR person to advocate, you know, and promote uh, an interfaith dialogue, you know, uh, celebrating different people's cultural diversity, encouraging diversity and, uh, and uh, equity and inclusivity, awareness campaigns in your organization, making sure that people are aware of the other faith. People who may not know are aware and, and they do not see the other faith as, uh, you know, whatever it is that they may have come to the organization with their mind. So it's a moment of realigning people's mindset to accept first and foremost and tolerate the other people's beliefs and also support them to encourage them to practice their faith in the best way possible without you know, seeing them or, or attaching some negative um, perceptions to those people who practice those uh, different religious beliefs. More so, you need to look at uh, your policies. What do your policies say about religious expressions in the, in the place of work? What can you do about it? Uh, does it is it all encompassing? Is it in any way having a form of discrimination? Uh, whether subtly or, or obviously, okay? We need to continuously review and, and, and update. And this review is important to do it with everyone, not just reviewing it in, in silo as an HR person. You, yeah, I'm, I'm all knowing. And then you are, you are reviewing the, the, the policies, you know, because no matter how well you know, you are just one perspective. Okay, there are more than one perspective out there that you need to engage to ensure that the policies and the practices in your workplace, especially as it relates to religious diversity, you know, is frequently, frequently updated to tackle the religious dynamics that come to play in your place of work. It may be possible that when you began your business, like our colleague um, <clears throat> earlier mentioned, that the, the, she went somewhere and they began to practice this prayer thing. 
Maybe because all of them share the same fate, it is easy to do. But as your organization begins to grow, if all of you share the same fate, the same you know, uh, kind of behavior, you realize that diversity might not, um, you will not enjoy from rich diversity. It comes with its own kind of challenges, especially where let us assume that everybody in the organization uh, attends a particular church and this church has a program at let's say uh, uh, maybe one particular week, they have a three days program that will start from a Monday up to a Wednesday, or maybe start from a, a Thursday up to a Saturday. And the organization also works on Saturday. You realize that chances are high that business will be shut down because everybody wants to participate in that activity. And if you don't allow everybody to go, you are definitely marginalizing on some people who also want to be there. Because you want to say, okay, let some people go, some people should not go. So everybody is not going to participate. And if everybody goes, the business is suffering. Your customers will not get your attention at that time because the business is shut down for everyone to go and attend that religious activity. It may be counterproductive. So it is very important that we have and encourage as HR practitioners, you know, rich diversity in our workforce so that we, our policies, you know, should also engage uh, or should be such that can engage all religion, irrespective of what religion, even those that presently are here today with us and those that may come in the future. Don't limit your, your policies to, yes, because all of us share the same faith, let's do a policy that works for us. Imagine that all of you are not from the same faith. Imagine that people will come in. And of course, that also makes your organization to become an attractive employer of labor. If you structure your policies to, you know, make life easy for you people because all of you there agree. Like one of our colleagues said that we agree and it works for us. So we make our policy like that. And then people that can contribute to the growth and development of the organization now come to see that this is what these people practice here and they are not okay with it. They most likely would just not accept your job offers and you are missing out on valuable talents that would have moved your organization forward. Then again, we need to engage the workforce in continuous dialogue, okay? It's not just about your, your opinion, because if you are to draft the policy yourself and, and make or you know, implement and all of those, you are most likely going to do it from your perception alone. But when you engage, you allow colleagues to air their voice, to, 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 to discuss and share with you maybe one area or so of the policy where they feel that they are not uh, being... Um, um, supported one area where they feel is is uh, marginalizing against them or discriminating against them to practice their own religion or their faith as well. Okay, so by engaging with them, creating an open door policy, allowing people to come to you, you know, to speak out and air their minds and tell you their concerns, give you suggestions. You will never know how best you can come up with a better, you know, uh, policy. So as HR practitioner, engage in continued dialogue with your workforce to ensure that everyone you know, gives you their feedback to a large extent so you can have a more engaging uh, workforce and a more supportive and collaborative work environment. More so, as an HR person, you can engage in education uh, activities, enlightening your people about the other religion, because sometimes people come from a perspective of uh, misconceptions, maybe because of... Uh, their religious indoctrinations before uh, coming to the workplace and what have you, okay? So as an HR person, don't ignore this. Engage actively in promoting, you know, activities and learning sessions where people come to understand a little bit more about the other religion and, and, and this will help to promote, you know, religious tolerance in the workplace and also improve your religious uh, uh, diversity in the, in, in the office. Okay, so engage a little bit more in training activities. Then you can also do some activities that uh, border around cultural awareness where you can uh, uh, encourage, you know, colleagues uh, to participate or do certain activities, you know, from, you know, certain cultures where people can begin to appreciate the culture of another person, the, the way of life of these people, the way they practice their religion, for example, and be able to relate with them better, right? For example, uh, I, I was born and grew up in the North, and I know, for example, in the North, that if I have a friend who is married, I, I cannot go to his house 
when he's not at home, okay? And, and the wife is there. I cannot visit even if I go and I knock at the gate and he's not at home. Whatever message I have, I will have to deliver it, you know, from the gate and, and, and find my way. I'm only allowed in, you know, I, I feel comfortable to come in when the husband of the house is at home, right? So if as an HR, I want to promote, you know, uh, my colleagues, you know, to visit one another and all of that. I need to put this at the back of my mind. If, for example, my organization is living in an area where this cultural practice is prevalent, we need to make sure that you, 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 you at least make sure that uh, if you are a lady, for example, before you go to visit, that the, the lady counterpart you're going to visit is fully at home and is ready to receive you before you come, you know, all of those things, so that we can be able to respect and tolerate one another. Then you need to consciously build bridges, okay? So in your team bonding activities, uh, uh, put in activities that will encourage people from different faiths to be members of the same team, work together, you know, uh, achieve certain goals or tasks, you know, together. That will help them, you know, uh, create more bond and friendship amongst them. And if they be, the more friendship they have amongst themselves, the more easy it is for them to understand one another and tolerate one another. So these are all. Uh, some of the things that you can do as an HR person to create an atmosphere where everyone is respected, their voices are heard, their opinions are respected, their beliefs are respected, and they are also equally allowed to practice their faith without fear and discrimination. Having highlighted this, I want us now to have a bit of conversation on this practical case study. Let us assume that you work as an HR manager in a medium-sized company known for its commitment to diversity and inclusion. The company employs individuals from various cultural and religious backgrounds. Just recently, you have, been, uh, you have received a complaint from a group of employees concerning one of their colleagues, Sarah. Sarah is a devout member of her faith and she regularly engages in conversations about her religion during, an, uh, during any opportunity she gets, okay? So including during working hours. Some of her colleagues have expressed discomfort with this as they believe it creates an uncomfortable atmosphere and distracts them from their work. They feel Sarah's discussions about her faith are on one third and infringe upon their right to work in a non-religious environment. As the HR manager, what will you do? So at this point, I want to hear your opinions. At least two or three persons share with us, what would you do in this kind of situation if you were the HR manager? Any hands up? Let's, uh, let me look at the charts. What would you do if this were you? Okay, uh, Ibabuchi. Can you can you unmute? Hello, good evening. You can unmute. Good evening. Hello, good evening. I hope you can hear me clearly, please. Yes, I can hear you. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Um, it's been a very lovely presentation. And um, I think this is a very sensitive topic that one most times um, as HR practitioners, we don't pay attention to them, but they go a long way to... Okay, we are know, losing you, Ibabuchi. ...to affecting a lot of things in an organization. So in this very case study, uh, for me, um, if can you hear me, sir? Am I audible now? Yes, you can go ahead. Yes. Okay. So um, as 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 I was trying to express earlier, I say if I were to be the HR manager, I think the 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 most um, sensible and the most responsible thing for me to do is to call Sarah and have a chat with Sarah. You know, in in the way that. Um, not to make her to feel bad or anything, 
but it's just, it's, it's, more, it's just more like um more like a hard to hot hard to hard talk to make her understand that yes, as much as she's convicted, you know, within her on what she is doing, and she feels that that is probably the right thing to do, whether it's a form of um uh, evangelize evangelism or something, but um she she should equally understand that it's not um to the extent that her approach to the extent that what she is doing is now causing some sort of um you know ill feelings you know on all that sort people feel that she's becoming a nuisance then there is a need for her to slow it down there is a need for her to you know dial it down a little bit let it be something that if she is going to do it it has to be at the right time and it has to be with somebody that is um, open to such uh, open to having so using whatever personal belief whatever personal conviction she has she, she just cannot go about sh- you know choking that down every other person's throat you know they have to hear her whether every other person likes it or not so um i, I believe it, every whole, everything is is about approach it's about dialogue by the time i engage with her and make her understand that um, there is a better way she can go about it i will hear from her no i probably understand why she's doing what she's doing and probably from there i will, I will able to you know advise uh, on the right way to go about it for me that's that's what i think about it thank you thank very, you much, very much your your response is well noted anyone else want to share their opinion what would you do yes jessica Hello, good evening, sir. Please, can you hear me? You need to be a bit more audible. Okay, can you hear me now, sir? Yes, yes. All right. Uh, th- thank you so much for this um, section. It's really um, what's the time and the, and the investment. Okay, so just like um, the first person that spoke uh, that answered the question said, I think the best approach is to first call her call the, um, the uh, employee in question and have a, uh, a heart-to-heart conversation with her. And um, to me, as the HR, the way I'll go about it is that, um, okay, uh, Mrs. A, I really appreciate, I really um, love your spirit. I love your conviction. And I, I, I really envy it because I want to also be as devoted as you are and convinced as you are to be able to boast of my faith like this. But um, then you know that uh, we are all different and that uh, we have different beliefs and from different backgrounds and the likes. So um, there has been, um, I've gotten quite a number of um, one or two complaints that of some people who are not, some persons who are not so convenient um, with your conversation about your faith, with your conviction, the way you discuss about your conviction, about your faith. Now, it doesn't mean that um, what you are doing is um, wrong to you. No, it's not wrong, but it's at, at the wrong time and to the wrong people. So I want to employ you to please. Um, everyone has a right of association. Everyone have their right. So do not um, try to limit or stop your conversation relating to your religion as we are all from, uh, we all have different beliefs. So you can only have I please have such conversations with someone who shares the same faith with you so that you don't have to make others feel uncomfortable. Do you understand? It's really a good thing that you are so convinced to the point that you can't wait to have an opportunity to talk about it. But you know, this is a work environment and we need everybody to be comfortable enough so they can be productive. So please reduce um, that um, conversation and limit it to people who share the same faith with you and are interested in the conversation so that others don't feel uncomfortable about it. That is the way I would have approached the question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. A very practical one. My sister from another family, Pear Ume, please. <laughs> Hello, Tuchiku. Okay, interesting one so far. Um, I feel if this situation arises, it's a clear indication that you do not have strong policies on things like this. Uh, for instance, where I am is um, the company I work in is a Muslim-dominated 
um, workplace, right? So what I tried to do was I created an etiquette manual. And that etiquette manual states the do's and don'ts, expected behavior, right? And um, the things we should do in the company. And part of it is we should not have um, religious discussions. And the, the explanation to that is that it could be, you know, distracting, right? And could possibly lead to um, arguments because some people are very passionate about this kind of things. So it's, in, it's, it's a print that every single person has, right? Not only did we just create this etiquette manual, it was shared with all staff, but discussed. So we had a knowledge sharing session where we discussed everything. So everybody knows what is ex, what is um, not expected. So as a HR, you should put these things in place, call her to order because she may not know. And really it is your fault as HR. So call her to order, put a manual in place, let people know what is expected of them in the workplace. Um, and I, I think that that's what I would do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So from all I've gathered from everyone who spoke, clearly, uh, we, we all agree that we need to call um, uh, this person in private and understand from their own perspective as well and possibly encourage or discuss with this person on the kind of behaviors that are acceptable and not acceptable in the workplace. Perhaps they are not aware. And then we, I can hear everyone saying that we equally agree that it is the right thing to do to look again at our policies. What does our policy say about uh, uh, the freedom of expression? Yes, the constitution allows people to propagate their, their faith and their beliefs, it's, it's okay. But then this is a work environment and this uh, propagation may impede on some, somebody's, um, um, uh, what do you call, uh, faith or belief. And these people already have told you or have expressed their displeasure in this. So it's important that we draw the line because for you as an HR, we are here trying to manage two things. One is the productivity of your uh, employees on one path. And then the other part, as far as this topic is concerned, is your religious inclusivity. So while you want people to practice their faith the best way they can, you are still conscious of the productivity of the workforce. So if one person's behavior impedes on everyone and causes discomfort, thereby affecting them in terms of their work hours and and uh, productivity, then it's most likely best to say, you know, uh, to draw the curtain. And in the event that after several intervention, uh, someone like Sarah, for example, is not yielding, then you might want to consider uh, perhaps uh, the hard decisions if necessary, because most important is that everybody must feel uh, protected and um, given the freedom to work without any kind of interference of anybody's um, faith. Then secondly, another case. Uh, you are the HR manager in a diverse company with employees from various religious backgrounds. Recently, you have received complaints and questions from both employees and supervisors regarding religious clothing and appearance, such as headgear, hijabs, trousers, uh, trousers not touching the ground, scarves, and long beards. The issue raised very from concerns about safety and hygiene to workplace distraction and uniform dress code policies. How will you effectively balance the accommodation of employees' religious clothing and appearance choices with company dress code and safety requirements, all within the framework of legal obligations and respect for individual beliefs in the workplace? Okay, so this is a typical situation where people, because of their religion, are supposed to dress in certain ways or certain manners, okay, wear certain kind of religious emblems or, or dress scenes or, or appear in certain ways or have some kind of certain lifestyle that is in line with their religion, right? And um, how would you be able to balance this as an HR person in the workplace, putting in mind your uh, the, the, the choices, what people want to dress, and also the safety and... and uh, uh, legal compliance issues for you in the organization. So let me hear your opinions again, maybe not from the people that have spoken before, if we can hear other people now, uh, so that we can engage more colleagues in this conversation. Anyone on the chats? 
Oh, someone is saying, Leticia says, uh, please, anyone should unmute and speak. Uh, we are, we are, we'll have your opinion. If new people are not willing to speak, if you've spoken before and you have an opinion, please feel free to share. You can also use the, the, the chat box. We'll read your opinion. Leticia says, maybe we should create a prayer altar for that kind of relaxation, but definitely not one we currently have. Hmm. Thank you for your opinion. Okay, Pell. Okay, thank you for this. Um, why I'm even raising up my hand to speak about this is because of, um, I'm currently, this is a situation I'm currently facing, right? So like I said, okay. um, I work somewhere in the north and uh, when I went for my induction as, as HR, I found out everything you have listed is exactly what I discovered. You know, some trousers that don't touch the floor. Some people wear their prayer garments to the office. And it and for a corporate entity, it did not look right. Now also, I had to be really careful because I am a minority, especially in terms of my religion. All the executive management are Muslims as well. So it's like, who, who are you to come here and change policies? We are saying that we want to make our, our company as corporate as possible. So we had to set out ground rules of how we are expected to behave. And everything was stated there that everyone should dress in a manner that, in a professional manner, such that anyone who sees you knows that you work in a corporate um, organization. You know, some people work, the way they dress, as if they're even going to buy Maggi. And we're saying that if somebody looks at you, would they know that you work in, you're going to work or you work in a corporate place? So we had to state this. And trust me, I, I got pushbacks immediately from even the focus group I created, you know, the team I created to work on that policy. They already pushed back that long before I came here, they have been like this. But at the end of the day, as long as I got buying from the people I report to, we had to set it. You know, and then not only set it, we then also had to pre create a dress code policy so that people could see how they are expected to look like. So it all came in manuals, and so far everyone is complying. Thank you. Thank you very much for that submission. Now um, I'm a little bit more curious. Uh, I, I I I grew up in the north, so I know the north a little bit more. I know that women are expected, for example, to wear hijabs. Uh, when they are out of their homes. So how would you balance your dress code and, uh, and this religious um, activity or mode of dressing? Because they need to put on this uh, item of um, uh, uh, clothing as part of practicing their religion. And how would you balance this together? Yeah. So in the case of hijab, um, and it's it's good that you said this because during your introduction, I could see that you I don't know whether you schooled in Bauchi or somewhere because that was where I did my induction. So I just felt it was it was a you know we can relate on some issues, right? So for hijabis, you can be you can be a hijabi and dress corporate. Now, the dress code we did was all encompassing. We're not trying to say you must wear suit all through, but you can wear hijab and still look, um, you know, corporate. And what we also did was to, the dress code catalog that we did, it's, you know, we had live pictures of people and what you're expected to do. So we had to include them. And they were okay with it as long as they can cover their hair. But what we did not accept is them wearing their prayer garments to the office. We said it's a no. When you want to pray, you can change into that. But as long as you're working, wear your hijab or but, um, dress corporately and that was how we were able to resolve it. As long as it's in paper, it's what it had been approved by executive management. Every other person had to, you know, fall in line. Thank you very much. That was very practical, exactly what I was looking for. Um, because we are saying we should promote religious inclusivity, you know, in the workplace and all of that, does not mean that we should undermine people's religion. So you as an HR person look at how can you fuse this together? You know, how can you moderate people wearing their religious attires and also being able to practice to, to, to appear in a way that, you know, 
is corporate enough that that gives an identity of an organization that is serious okay so this is some of the areas where you need to come in as an hr practitioner to moderate not throwing away their religious customs or practices completely but doing your dress code in such a way that it inculcates what's the the main essence of their religious practice without necessarily you know um um, um giving up the organization's uh, uh, dress code. More importantly, when it comes to safety standard, for example, like she mentioned, when certain people wear, um, what do you call, um, dress garments to work, yes, it, it, because maybe it's a Friday and they want to wear their dress garments to the church, uh, to, to, to the office and, and, and what have you, it's okay. But then you can imagine a situation where this person operates uh, a machine you know, and because of that machine, that person needs to wear certain kind of clothing, or maybe they work in a place where they need to wear some sort of protective clothing. If they don't dress properly, they are exposing you to safety issues, which will be a bigger problem for the organization. So it is important to take this all into consideration while you are coming up with your dress code. Yes, have a dress code, but your dress code should not totally ignore the religious values of people that work with you. Right, so you should be able to find a way to moderate, you know, your the the dress codes and the religious practices. Yes, I see someone's hand is up. Olumide, uh, share with us what you have, please. Olumide. Okay, um, Tochukwu, thank you very much. Thank you for this um awesome section. Um, can you hear me, please? Loud and clear. Okay, great, great, great. Um, so I love this um practical cases. I'm actually taking a lot of notes. Um, I just want to deviate a little. Okay, so I joined my current organization. Uh, when I joined, the policy stated that uh, that's about four years ago. Stated um, you have to wear striped shirt, you have to wear suit, you have to wear tie, you have to do this, you have to. I think it was nitty gritty of colors, no flower, no patterns. So I had to change it. Then the moment I changed it, people started relaxing. We let go of tie, okay, because it's um, a software development company. We have developers, we have these IT guys and all of those things. You know, four years back, it was already like, these guys don't dress corporately. Now, so the issue, changing that um, policy and um, replacing it with dress appropriately, dress professional, dress in such a way that we could call you to go and represent us at a client site and you would still look corporate. Now, the issue I have right now that, you know, I want everybody to just, you know, um, share and probably I learned from it is. So now I have developers coming to the office with joggers. If I walk hybrid, I have developers coming to the office with joggers, with Crocs, and they tell me, oh, this Crocs is very expensive. I bought like 25,000. I'm like, this is not a professional footwear and they're like hey child we're not going out now we're in the office okay so what if a client calls and you need to go and represent us right now say but i'm looking good this professional casual and we have this conversation and dragging almost all day and they're like hey, okay do you want us to go back to thai we should wear thai and i'll look for another job and i'm like okay how can I win this battle? You know, I just want everybody to contribute. So I'll probably I can learn and, you know, look at it from another um perspective. Thank you very much, Toshiko. Thank you, my dear. Thank you, Alamide. Um, I, I see Fola Shade's hand is also raised up before we attempt your question. Let's listen to Fola Shade and uh, maybe she also has an idea to share with you. Fola Shade, please. Okay, meet. good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Mr. Tochiku. Thank you for so much for sharing your your thoughts and ideas around this um this topic, actually. All right, so the, I'm gonna be addressing um the first um uh, sorry, you're going to have to manage with me. I have my kids, so you just they are okay. part of the family. <laughs> All right, so thank you so very much. This is my own little bit, right? So for the Ijabian sisters, what are you looking for? For me, I have, okay, so I work with developers. 
I work with all manner of, you know, um, what's it called? And this, there's a particular girl. She's an Ijabian sister. She, as a matter of fact, it's only her face that you will see. And she will cover it everywhere down. Highly effective developer. A, um, a devop, you know? I, fine, we work at hybrid. There are days that she will come in. She would, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for you to look good. Are you results oriented? Are you effective? Since I don't see you every day, this is your religion. This is your ritual. This is what you believe in. And we have another person who is also a Muslim and just covers her head. She will dress shirt down. She's in the sales. She will do shirts, sometimes trousers, skirts, and all of that. The thing is, we just have to let everyone um, flow the way they feel um, it should be. So long it is what the aim at the end of the day is achieved. The organizational um, objective at the end of the quarter, at the biannual, and at the end of the year is achieved. No one is lagging. That's all that matters for me in my own organization. <laughs> What's it called? The developers just come in when they like. Maybe they have meeting with the CTO or the, with the product manager. When we see them, we are happy that you even remembered us. And those guys are the bedrock of any applications you see out there. They don't sleep. So if even if they had to come, you see them, you'd be like, why are you looking like this? It's because they are the same way their applications are being arranged. All right? So you just want to tell them that uh, do your, just look good. Business casual is what I preach for people, even though you are a developer. Just make sure you do business casual. As much as you want to look rough and all of that, do your jeans and your polo shirts. Maybe you want to go ahead and give um, them the office. I don't know if you have a brand branded T-shirt. You just want to give them days that you might need to come. Maybe this is what you want to do. As much as it look good, as long as it look good rather, and you know they feel comfortable in it. I think that one will also help. So that's that's just my own little bit. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Time is fast running away. Um, our friend uh, Olami did ask the question. Please look at the chat box. Some people have suggestions for you, and I don't want to add to that already because I totally agree. You need to possibly look again at your policy and see how you can adjust. So, uh, last. Case study, you work in a company with about 48% Muslim, 40% traditional worshippers, 7% Christians, and 5% of the workforce do not subscribe to any religion. Your company is based in the north central region of Nigeria. Two months ago, the Muslims have approached management to approve a space for them to build a mini mocks to save them time and stress of going to the main mocks, which is 15 minutes away from the office to pray. Management granted their request and the mocks was completed last week. Now, the traditional worshippers have approached management to request permission to build their shrine within the office premises as well. Management has referred them to you, the HR manager. How will you handle this issue? So I will take just two opinions because of time. You can drop message on the chat as well. Okay. But why didn't uh, management refer to HR when Muslims wanted to build the mosque in the first place? It is the traditional work. Is HR the one to put a DRD to <laughs> uh, Very interesting. Very, very interesting. So <laughs> now, I mean, this is, this is, some of the things that you may encounter in the, in the workplace. But then everybody must be given their right to practice their religion. As far as it does not impede on the organization's um, um, image or the organization's ability to 
carry out its operations and what have you. Okay, well, just one person I will have, uh, Imolayo Dekunle. Please unmute and in one minute, let's hear your opinion because we have to round up in the next two minutes. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, sir, for this wonderful um, session. So, <clears throat> in my own opinion, I would say um, if you, you pose yourself as an organization that um, preaches um, equality all around, gender, religion, and all of that, you should ensure that you stick by that um, policy, right? So if you have, um, if you granted, if the uh, management granted the Muslims request and the traditional worshippers want their own shrine, it's better to give them their shrine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. He says it's better to give them their shrine. Yes, it's good to give everybody a sense of belonging, but that should be moderated with organizations, uh, goals and aspirations and their activity. If any practicing any of this religion in the workplace or giving them this opportunity will impede upon the organization's ability to carry out its business or relate with its clients or even... Um, affect their image in any way, you need to calmly make them understand why this uh, uh, um, this uh, request may not be granted, you know, and, and keep it in view to review subsequently when things improve or when things change. So we need to be very careful. In other words, we need to be very careful when we are taking certain decisions because it is favorable today. That does not mean it may be favorable tomorrow. You need to also equally ask yourself if it is the other way around, will it easily also go well? Okay, because what you set as precedents may come back to bite you tomorrow. So you need to be very, very careful about some of these decisions. Think a little bit far ahead and try to imagine what happens even afterwards. So bringing it all together, religion is indeed a core aspect of human culture, especially for us in Nigeria. And it is actually a matter of constitution. It is allowed in the, our constitution for people to practice their religion. And then religious diversity can create misunderstanding. It can create bias, conflict, tension, and even unfair treatment in the workplace where you allow certain people to build their own worship place. You don't want to allow others to build. And then now they, they begin to look at it as though you are being unfair. Okay, so these are all kind of ways where religion can, you know, rear its ugly head in, in uh, you know, if not curtailed, may become a problem in the, in, the, in the office. And then as HR practitioner, you have the critical role to play in creating an inclusive and harmonious work environment where all employees, irrespective of their faith, will feel valued and respected. Because only then can people be able to meaningfully contribute to an organization. If they feel the organization does not respect or value them, chances are very high that their engagement level in that organization will be very low. And lastly, HR practitioners, you are the main advocate of inclusivity. You are the educators that will drive down inclusive behaviors and messages across the organization. You are the one that will mediate between people from diverse religious backgrounds, irrespective of your own religious belief. You need to look at religion from every area that shows one of the critical things every HR person must have is emotional intelligence. To be able to relate with everybody, you are going to be the mediator to settle these tensions in the event that they arise. And then you are the policy maker and the policy enforcer to ensure that the organization is aligned in a particular way that will, en uh, will engage all your employees and improve in terms of uh, uh, your productivity as an organization, keeping your organization or company competitive at all times, making you an employer of choice for everyone to you know, want to uh, join your organization. So you are the bedrock to push for organization uh, uh, to be very inclusive and respect everyone's uh, cultural and religious beliefs. So I'm counting on you as, as soon as you leave here, when you go back to your offices, have a bit of reflection. What can you improve upon? Is it your policy? Is it an engagement with the staff? What can you do differently that will make your staff feel more valued is it uh, campaigns that you need to launch? Whatever that is necessary, depending on your assessment of your organization, where you stand and what must happen, please don't waste time. Do it immediately and um, we'll see uh, how your organization will definitely go from where it is 
to where it is expected to be. Um, my friends and colleagues, at this point, I want to draw the curtain. We've um, been able to entertain uh, discussions, questions on the chat and um, in our conversations. So I, I wouldn't know if uh, there are any other questions that we've not addressed. Uh, um, I don't know. Are there questions that we've not been able to address just yet before we call it trust for the so evening? So Tuku, this is the time where I come in as the host because of yes. time. I want no to tell you, Totuku, that if there are questions yet to be addressed, when our participants are having that, they will get inspiration. You know, you have done excellently well. I agree completely that this is not a very easy topic to undo. You have demonstrated extreme maturity, confidence, and very importantly for me, you have provided balance. I'd like to celebrate you on behalf of the over 50, 60 people who joined the live session and the several hundreds of people who watch the recorded version. Thank you to everybody tonight who contributed either via their voice or through the chat and shared their opinions, their thoughts, their experience. This has been very, very insightful. And I will recommend this session, watch the recording again, share it with your friends, because this is why we are here. Someone said that HR is found at the difficult intersection. But our job is to ensure that there is industrial harmony. And our facilitator has said to us that we need to pay attention to the matters of religion because it can lead to um, imbalance. It can lead to tension that may hamper productivity. Thank you so much for all the case studies that highlighted real life scenarios which many of us can relate with. Some of us have gone through it. Some of us will, will go through it. And even from this topic, we could even extend to, for example, the issue around how software developers can be extremely laser sphere in, in their addressing to show the dexterity of the topic. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a night. We'll see you again by God's grace. Inshallah. Good night, everyone. Thank you for having me. Good